morning. Good morning, good morning. Um, I officially want to make sure that everyone knows that, <laughs> this is hysterical to me, that food has bumped Democrats over there. <laughs> so um, the, the panel, Democrats, where are we now? Apparently you're in the East Ballroom, just in case you're in the wrong venue. If you eat, you, you might want to be here. Um, but we kind of wish there would have been a mashup of both into yeah, one, absolutely. right? So I'm Sylvia Taz, um, honored to be here with our distinguished speakers and um, to actually have food after 68 conferences on world affairs, 68 years, guess what? Food now matters. <laughs> we have a food track. Um, I'm with the Fresh Ideas Group and it is a local PR marketing firm that has always specialized in food. And um, my husband and I, in our spare time, own Pastures of Plenty Farm and sell at four farmers markets and are allowed by Boulder County to do 12 real farm to table events. And that's another story about land use. Um, I want to um, read this official thing so we can get into the meat and organic potatoes of this session, because um, there's good stuff to be had. So um, in this CWA session, we will utilize both the fun CWA app and a note card system to receive your questions. I think a lot of people here have already been kind of inculcated to that. Um, please, um, to ask a question, simply go to the app and um, in the schedule and tap live Q&A and then insert your question. Um, in the spirit of good old fashioned mannerliness, you may also raise your hand at any time and our wonderful volunteers will come by with real paper and pencils and you can write your question. Um, please note we will prioritize students. So you students out there, please don't be shy. We want your voices to be heard. Um, so we're gonna dive right in on the topic, Chef's Collaborative, how to build a better food system. And um, wanna just cite that we have to my immediate left, Deanne Bayless, she is, um, I'm just gonna say this, she is the person that manages all of the Bayless's restaurants, <laughs> right? So that Chef Bayless can be the creative guy that he is. <laughs> yes. <laughs> is that fair? And I eat well. Yes. <laughs> so um, Deanne has been a <clears throat> very active member of Women's Chefs and Restaurant Tours. And honestly, there are so many activist organizations represented by our expert speakers today. Um, she will reference that a little bit. Um, I just found out that she grew up in Chicago, 100% Dutch family, um, like me, had a mom who was a, quote, serviceable cook, right? But <laughs> that was my word. We did not grow up in gourmet culinary families, right? I never had a fresh beat until I went to England and um, experienced that for the first time. So let's just get over our little gourmet foodie selves in that way, <laughs> right? And then um, Chef Bayless, obviously cookbook author. We don't need to go through his bio. He's lucky again to have Deanne in his life. <laughs> and then we have um, Richard McCarthy, who I was lucky enough to meet not as the executive director of Slow Food USA, which is his current title, but when he did something close to my heart, which he was the manager of farmer's markets in New Orleans, and I met him as the first convention to come back to New Orleans post-Katrina. And I'm always gonna cry when I think about that. So, um, so he has great knowledge in both the arc of farmer's markets and what that has to do with our food um, culture. And then Piper Davis, she is the chair of Chef's Collaborative Board. She's also a partner in Grand Central Bakery. Um, unlike Deanne and I, she grew up in a terribly cool, hippie, back to the land, <laughs> food farm family. And of course, she's from Portland, so. <laughs> So to open this up, um, I actually wanted to just provide a quick frame, and then if I may, I'm gonna pass the baton to Rick. We are not gonna have this session be four minutes each talking heads. It's gonna be highly interactive, and we're gonna try and make sure we leave time for all those student questions, okay? Um, I, I just looked up some dates because I don't trust my memory after only one cup of coffee, and it's an interesting thing that was happening back in the 80s and early 90s. So just a couple milestone dates, because we're gonna go back 30 years before we start in how to build a better food system today. 
1985 was the very first Farm Aid concert. It was in Illinois. Um, it was founded by Willie Nelson, Neil Young, and John Cougar Mellencamp, who later took out the Cougar from his name. Um, Chef's Collaborative was founded in 1993. It was actually founded um, at a gathering in Hawaii. So these geographic places are germane, and we'll explain quickly in a little bit. Slow Food International was founded in 1986. Don't you all worry if you weren't born then. This is going to become relevant quickly. Um, and, and Slow Food was founded in Bra, Italy. Um, it wasn't until 2000 that Slow Food got really hip and founded itself as Slow Food USA in Brooklyn. Um, Frontera Grill, founded 30 years ago, 1987, um, by these two visionaries founded in Chicago. And what were they thinking? An authentic Mexican food restaurant in Chicago? in the 80s. So just note that none of those places were gourmet culinary epicenters then. One might argue for some of those areas that they were unknown in terms of what their, their kind of food um, culture was. Um, and so a lot of the activist food organizations today were actually born at a time when I think as a society, we didn't really understand, perhaps, the importance of food. But now that we've bumped democracy next door, it's vitally important. Um, Rick, could you, could, you, could you take us back, old sage, to okay. <laughs> being the polite man that he is, he's going to let me talk yeah, first. Yeah, well, uh, the, the, I'm going to introduce Deanne because um, she she's was looking on the outside as I was being super frustrated at the very beginning of our restaurant um, in what, what it was like to be a chef in 1987. And so uh, she's going to sort of give a, an outsider's view of what she saw us going through, those of us that founded the Chef's Collaborative. So one of my strongest memories of the early days, and I have actually quite a few, uh, was Rick coming back from his shopping trip to the, to the uh, market where we bought all our goods. The, it was the produce terminal. There was, you know, one big one. And it was the height of strawberry season, and he went down there to look for some delicious strawberries, not uh, st local strawberries, small ones with good flavor. And uh, he, he talked to people, I remember him coming back and describing how he talked to people, and they said, are you kidding? We would never carry that here. And so he was just so frustrated because he knew that around us there was wonderful stuff, but how are we going to get it? And then, and then we started trying to find, in 30 years ago, there were no local farmers delivering to restaurants in Chicago. I think it was like two years after we opened that there started to be local farmers. And, um, and it, it's taken a long time, well, it maybe took another 10 years till the system really started opening up. So it, it, was, a very, it was a very barren time in our, uh, for chefs in our food system. And at that time, chefs weren't even that respected. You know, they were like a car mechanic. And, you know, they, put, they followed a recipe. They didn't care about the, these kinds of things. And then this woman came along in Berkeley with very radical ideas and, and started a very radical concept restaurant. Alice Waters, I'm sure you all know who I'm talking about. And she sort of launched this revolution where people, uh, chefs like Rick, who cared more, who were not just wanting to be car mechanic chefs, they, had, they started to see they, there was a, a chance to do something different, to have a voice. And so, they, uh, and so they began, all of them in different places, thinking about these kind of things. And they, they could follow their other passions like, like sourcing good ingredients and like uh, being ecologically oriented, caring about the soil, caring about the recycling, all those kind of things. People who were, who were leaning that way were starting to see here and there a few other people doing that. And that was, that was the energy which with that first group met, as I could see. I remember Rick coming back from that first trip and him talking. Mostly I remember him talking about the poi he ate uh, with the natives there and how they, f they created this huge fe uh, feast for them. It was a luau, right? It was yeah. a luau. And, and he talked about 
the traditions and the food things he ate, which he had never had before, this fermented poi, which is kind of odd stuff, but it was like so, they welcomed them into their culture and into their food, and they were, the chefs were so thrilled by that. And I remember, so the energy of other cultures started from the beginning. And just about the same time, there was a group of, of women chefs, mostly in San Francisco, who also were, were seeing not only that need, because they were all of the same breed, but also the need for a role for women in this very male-dominated, uh, which back then was super male-dominated profession. Uh, now it's just profession. kind of male-dominated. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's a lot better. <laughs> anyway, uh, but they saw this need to band together and try to find a voice, and that was women chefs and restaurateurs. And so we were, sist and actually I got very involved with that right from the beginning. I was president for about six or seven years. And we were sister and brother organizations working on the same path, just with slightly different emphases. And so that was, that, that was those early years when we, both of us, gave tons and tons of energy to, f to nurturing this sprouting seed of, of caring about all this stuff. And, okay. and Rick, why did yeah. Chef's Collaborative need to be founded, in your opinion? Um, sort of as Deanne said, it was a really bleak time. Um, there were, uh, well, I'll uh, just lay the landscape of Chicago. Um, I, we settled in Chicago um, partly because of the large Mexican population there. Um, still to this day, people say, what? There's a large Mexican population in Chicago? Yes, it's the second largest in the country. Um, about 20% of the population of Chicago is Hispanic. And most people say, oh my gosh, no, it has to be someplace else. But it's true, it is in Chicago. And it, because it's fairly recent immigration, it's less recent. Um, I, I've said that for 30 years. It's recent immigration, so it's becoming not so recent immigration now. Um, but the, we had a lot of amazing stores selling all of the ingredients from back home, if you will. And um, I, we had been living part-time in Los Angeles doing some consulting work, and um, I was finding a greater variety of Mexican ingredients like every day in the grocery stores in Chicago than I was in Los Angeles because it's older immigration and they've sort of gotten to, to know what it's like to cook without those things. But the Chicago immigrants hadn't gotten there and so they were really demanding of those things and I thought it'd be just a great, a great opportunity for us to open in a place where we could get things that were coming in from Mexico um, we when I when we opened up there was not a farmers market in Chicago there were as Deanne said no uh, any farms that were delivering into Chicago and uh, we had just moved back from Mexico and the one big lesson that I learned in Mexico was that the food the, the best food was always available in the places with the best local agriculture and I thought, man, we have a long road ahead of us if we want to put Chicago on the map. Now, I could have just turned my back on all of that and said that, well, we're just going to fly everything in. And in fact, one chef that opened, his a famous chef that opened his restaurant at the same time that we did, um, actually said that in the press. I would never use anything that's grown locally. I would only fly in all of my food from uh, other special places that have great agriculture. And I thought, well, that's certainly like shooting yourself in the foot, right? Because if we want to be a great restaurant town, then that those kinds of ingredients have to be available for everyone. And our, um, our, our need at that time was to try to build that local agriculture. But at the same time, we were, uh, there were s these chefs around the United States, and we were kind of pulled together by an organization that still exists in Boston called Old Ways Preservation and Exchange. And what they were trying to do was to shine a light on traditional food um, in different parts of the world. So they would get journalists and some chefs and uh, writers and, and academicians to get together for conferences in different places. And we could just immerse ourselves in the culinary traditions of those places. And in, through that, and we are very thankful that Old Ways existed and brought us together, but we sort of had this idea that we should have a separate organization through Old Ways that would just be chefs so that we could 
start to develop a voice. And as Deanne said, um, it sort of all came out of Alice Waters' vision that you don't have to follow the regular path. You can actually represent and offer to your guests a completely new way of thinking about food. And it certainly had that ecological background. It had activism involved in it. It had um, a, a whole host of culinary traditions and ingredients that were not mainstream. And we all just wanted to support each other with this, uh, with this um, organization. So we opened as an offshoot of, uh, we opened the Chef's Collaborative as an offshoot of the Old Ways Preservation and Exchange Trust. And they managed our organization with us and helped us to grow and that sort of thing until it, we got big enough that we could separate off from that. And now it's an independent organization. But we all met at an Old Ways conference in 1993 um, in Hawaii. Now, it sounds like we were like on Waikiki and we were just like soaking up the rays or something, but we weren't. We were on the big island, which is almost entirely um, agricultural. And they had all these incredible opportunities for us to really interact with local farmers. And then the, the taro farmers in the YPO Valley invited us for this super like working class um, luau um, that we none of us will ever forget as long as we live because we had the opportunity to see the integrity of these people and their culinary traditions um, right firsthand and just to hang out with them. We decided the next day to have a big meeting of just the chefs and we got together this was really um, like sitting on the beach and soaking up the rays. And we were on the, in the, the, on the big island outside of the hotel where the whole thing was going on. And there were about 30 of us that were there that to, to try to put together the idea of what this organization would be. And though our mission has sort of been slightly modified through the years and the principles have been massaged through the years. We worked for eight hours straight on just coming up with what our mission and principles would be. And um, as is tradition in Chef's Collaborative uh, uh, gatherings, that we will read that mission out loud and those principles. So um, though we've, we've lost Sylvia now, um, <laughs> we, I'm going to read the, the um, mission of it. And then each person on our panel will read one of the principles here. So the mission of the Chef's Collaborative uh, reads as follows. Chef's Collaborative is a national nonprofit network with a mission to inspire, educate, and celebrate chefs and food professionals building a better food system. And the statement of principles begins with the first one, which is food is fundamental to life, nourishing us in body and soul. The preparation of food strengthens our connection to nature, and the sharing of food immeasurably enriches our sense of community. Good food begins with unpolluted air, land, and water, environmentally sustainable farming and fishing, and humane animal husbandry. Food choices that emphasize delicious, locally grown, seasonally fresh, and whole or minimally processed ingredients are good for us, for local farming communities, and for the planet. Cultural and biological diversity are essential for the health of the earth and its inhabitants. Preserving and revitalizing sustainable food, fishing, and agricultural traditions strengthen that diversity. By continually educating themselves about sustainable choices, chefs can serve as models to the culinary community and the general public through their purchases of seasonal, sustainable ingredients and their transformation of those ingredients into delicious food. The greater culinary community can be a catalyst for positive change by creating a market for good food and helping preserve local farming and fishing communities. The, vi the vision of the, the collaborative is sustainable practices will be second nature for every chef in the United States. Okay, so that's, <clears throat> that's pretty highfalutin. And um, first of all, I want to address to all of the students that are here, 
um, that I have laid out a landscape that you probably can have no relationship to 30 years ago when we were starting our restaurant 24 years ago when we started the Chef's Collaborative. Um, we, we live in a different world today. And so I will say to the, the students that you're a really important part of the next wave of what our food system is going to be about. And um, I want you guys to participate a lot today because your questions are going to be the questions that we need to answer because we had a vision that was exactly right for us 25, 30 years ago. We need to know what your vision is for the future, what your needs are for the future. And um, for those of you that um, are of like age to those of us up here on the panel, um, we will ask you to participate too because we wanna know what your thoughts are. That last, that vision, the sustainable practices will be a second nature for every chef in the United States. Um, it's something that I could say probably all of us would say, well, sorta, it's, we, we've sort of achieved that vision. I mean, maybe we've done it, maybe we haven't, I don't know. Where, where do we fall on that continuum? I live in a world where like all of my chef friends are kind of in that, they, they, they think about those things generally. But I'm not sure all chefs in the United States do, and I'd probably live in a small little bubble but can't see outside of that bubble sometimes. So um, we, we would really like this. We don't bubbles in Boulder at all. <laughs> <laughs> at all. I love preaching to the choir. Um, okay. <laughs> so uh, it, anyway, we want you guys to participate in this as much as possible because we can talk a lot about uh, where we have, and we will, uh, about where we see we have come over the last 30 years. Um, but we need your participation too to help uh, develop the vision for the future. So let's, let's take it to the present tense. So um, Chef's Collaborative, Piper, can you give us a no BS answer? Like, have we won the fight and there's no need for an activist food organization of chefs and eaters? Um, where are we today? <laughs> S say it, it's okay. No. What no. you're thinking. No, we have, I am very, like, we have made, there's tremendous, when you really think, Sylvia got us, like, to really look back, because I'm a little bit of a pessimist about, like, I'm about things sometimes, and um, the, I think a tremendous amount of change has happened over the last 25 to 30 years, um, but currently we still have not, um, I think that, that a lot of chefs, and a lot of people like to talk about sustainable food, a lot of people like to talk about good food, everybody wants good food, but we still have incredible um, production, distribution, infrastructure, knowledge, skills, accessibility, blah, 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 issues. So we have a lot of work, we've come a long way, but we have a lot of work to do to get to the future. And um, that, I guess, okay. that would be, I think we'll talk about some specific links later but um so i think that's kind of i think that there's still there's definitely still work to do but i don't want it's it's really important to look back at this world where um someone's probably heard me tell this story before but i mean when we when when we started our journey at the bakery the first step was taking tomatoes off the sandwiches unless they were in season and that was so my partners almost i almost like got kicked out of the business for doing it our customers were so pissed our employees were pissed because the customers were pissed and for the entire year that they had tell from because it was like from october until you know july 15th there was no tomatoes and then on july 16th the whole menu was tomatoes and they had that blt <laughs> they had that caprese and then they were like okay now we get it <laughs> It's kind of like a naked sandwich, the no tomato thing. <laughs> so, thank you, William Burroughs. Um, so, taking it to slow food, um, uh, Richard, can, can you uh, draw upon your prior slow food experience and just share what you've seen as the arc of farmers markets and what that really has to do with the better food movement? Well, for one, uh, it's so interesting to, to look at uh, the mission, statement of principles, and vision for the Chefs Collaborative, um, because it is so aligned mm -hmm. and uh, with Slow Food. Now, of course, Slow Food, founded in Italy, we have a manifesto um, that is read best when drunk. Uh, <laughs> really drunk. Really drunk. Um, it is aspirational, uh, as I think this is, um, but I, I, I think that it, it speaks to, and then I think the food movement speaks to, this word collaborative. 
a recognition that we are not alone and that it requires uh, forging a new social contract with people around us. Um, and I think always the challenge is, are we bonding with people like us or are we bridging to people who we may not know, we may not trust, we may not value? And that the promise of food is that we can begin to forge these new links. And, and when you look at what happened in the 1980s, which I know seems like a very, very long time ago. Um, Do you the, remember them? <laughs> yeah. Most of them? <laughs> um, I mean, I, I think that in this current age of crisis, we think back to periods of, oh yeah, when I liked music, when, you know, all, all these sort of earlier eras. Um, the 80s were an extraordinary disruptive period of crisis. Um, uh, the role of government in our lives, the Cold War, the farm crisis, the extraordinary, uh, Sylvia described the f farm aid in the early 80s. We've, we've been in perpetual crisis about how do we organize our lives? What are the expectations? What are the rules? If I behave, what, will, what stability will I have in my lives? And, and I, I think, and I, when I fell into food, before I discovered slow food as, as sort of this global movement that I realized I was part of, it was Chess Collaborative 2000, right? Yes. Yes, yes. which is sort of a crazy thought because it was founded with this idea that by the year 2000, we're going to reach this. Right. And, um, and I think something rather extraordinary happened as we stumbled into the 21st century is uh, unlikely allies and unlikely leaders emerged and began to voice uh, a different idea of what community looks like. It was a little bit like a brush fire. It happened, it felt at the time rather quickly, this 30-year brush fire. Um, but what emerges, emerges first after a brush fire is the prairie grass, really simple organisms, ones that are within reach. And I think owner-operated restaurants that could connect directly to, to, sh to farmers. Farmers markets that require relatively little infrastructure, and as they grew from 17, 1,700 farmers markets in 1994 to over 10,000 today, you know, sort of an extraordinary, explosive, unsustainable growth. It's now leveling off, um, but we're beginning to see that those are within early, within that sort of early reach of what can we accomplish. These are fairly simple low center of gravity institutions, we began to forge collaboratives. Collaboratives between urban and rural, uh, between food traditions that are thought of as high art food traditions versus marginalized communities food traditions. And I, I think of in New Orleans where we established the farmer's markets in 1995, reinventing that tradition. Uh, it was many ways on the heels of uh, Paul Prudhomme's success uh, when a, you know, a Cajun chef, the most sort of lowly, unrespected cuisine, rural, irrelevant cuisine, uh, becomes center stage at the city, city's most important restaurant, Commander's Palace. Um, that is a symbolic and significant transformation of marginal uh, food traditions becoming center stage. Um, but of course, we haven't brought in enough people into the collaboration. Uh, we, we're beginning to really move beyond the margins into the town square, beginning to forge a new social contract between supply and demand. Um, for those who show up, uh, there have been extraordinary moves, whether it's um, the growth of urban gardens, community gardens, school gardens, uh, farmers markets with uh, incentive programs, incentivizing vulnerable communities to spend food stamps at farmers markets. Um, the collaboration is growing wider and wider, but it also becomes more complex because the ecosystem changes where it's not just prairie grass, it's many more sophisticated and specialized plants or institutions mm -hmm. that are uh, beginning to forge new ties and, f and finding solutions that are much more complex, and the complex issues are animal agriculture, grains. How do we begin to build a new infrastructure around these values? Not the industrial values that are all about food as fuel, but these values that um, uh, celebrate place, generate wealth, and create community. 
I'm going to stop there. Sorry. Bring us to the present tense. Great, more students. Yay, women. Yay. <laughs> um, so we have a lot of questions coming, and a lot of them for students. So I want to prioritize that. But if each of you could just think right now, facing forward in your respective roles, think about what's the number one thing you wish was better in the food movement today. And I'm going to say something to everybody here, because it's a very white crowd. Um, you know, is the good food movement elitist, white, and precious? <coughs> Who would like well, to well, I, well, let's take that for granted. But um, um, <laughs> I, uh, I was thinking about what the one thing that I think would make the, for me, which is, relevant business, relevant personally, and relevant with the climate and the earth would be a complete transformation of the way we raise animal protein um, to a pasture-based, carbon sequestering, restorative system. Okay, thank you. Numbness, um, that there's so much stuff coming to chefs, because that's my perspective, that sometimes the chefs just become numb to it all. And then they make decisions that are not the most thoughtful decisions just because they're kind of numb to how much information is around them. And they, it's like, look, I have to get my orders in tonight because I have to serve my guests tomorrow. And I think a lot of times people that are not in the restaurant business don't understand what pressure there is in that. We, we can't say to our guests, oh, come back tomorrow. You know, we didn't feel like making that dish tonight. Um, so it's, um, it, it, there's a lot of pressure to just order and get the stuff in and get it prepped and get it on the table. And sometimes uh, we just get numb to how much stuff is coming at us that we just make a decision and go with it because we don't have the next three days to take off and, and really be thoughtful about understanding what all of the, um, the arguments are on different sides of a certain kind of order. <laughs> go ahead. Well, it is meat. I, I think we have to change our relationship to meat and, and what that ripple effect means. It'll, it'll, It'll change everything. And I think we have to, if we eat meat, we have to face the fact that animals are being raised and slaughtered for us. And um, we work with this amazing farmer. I'm sorry, it makes me really <laughs> emotional to think of this man because he's now the second largest pastured poultry farmer in the country. And we've worked with him for a long time. And he's just naturally brilliant. but. Our chefs went, a bunch of them, like 10 of them, went to his place. He also, has a, a, he also has a slaughter facility and a USDA inspector on his property all the time. But he, they went to this, you've got to tell the story, because it, I've never seen them come back so sort of humbled and moved. Well, th this fellow, um, oh, he's a pig farmer, uh, like a four, third or fourth generation pig farmer in northern Indiana. And the fellow is, um, as Dan says, sort of just naturally brilliant. If you met him on the street, you would think that he didn't have very much between his ears. And yet he's like super, super smart in one of the most intuitive ways that I've ever experienced. And he came to us to sell his pork, and we had a pork farmer. And so we said, no, no, but what we really need is really good chickens. And he said, I, I'm not, I'm a pork farmer. And we said, no, no, what we really need is chickens. And um, so we kept like knocking on his door to say, you know how to raise chickens, right? And uh, he said, well, I got some chickens out back, but I couldn't say that I could go into production. But he had this, the slaughter facility on his property, uh, which is a very rare uh, thing, and it's a USDA plant. So um, because he's right on the northern border of Indiana, so he's got to have that USDA inspection to get across state lines. And so um, anyway, we worked with him for two years, and it was a really rough two years because he was going to do only pastured poultry. Um, but now he's become, as Deanne said, the second largest pastured poultry uh, uh, guy in the country. And when you see pictures of his farm or visit his farm, it's just really, really remarkable because um, it, it feels so much in tune with nature. So we have gone for many years um, on an annual pilgrimage down to his place to just um, hang out there. We take food. Uh, we see the pretty pigs and the, and the chickens out in the field and everything. But I said, you you know, I, I want to sl slaughter. I want us to slaughter <laughs> because there, there's one thing that's missing from our experience, and that is going through the whole kill process. 
And um, I always say that everybody should really experience that if we're going to eat meat because it is a part of that that is always hidden away from us. So we went there um, and we all did it. And um, it was one of the most emotional um, experiences of my life and I would say for all the chefs that were with us. And um, in the van coming back, um, we no one spoke a word. We didn't have, uh, we didn't have a radio on. We all just sat in silence, realizing that we had participated in the full experience of it, and it was hard. <laughs> and uh, so that's the kind of thing that I think in so many ways that um, we have to be able, when we're thinking about meat, and obviously meat is a big topic here, that we have to understand that it's an even more complex issue when you take into account um, what it means to go from the bucolic pasture raised animals to that that meat on the plate but the thing i remember most when they came back was two things that rick said and i didn't go i wasn't sure i could face it and i will confess to that um, but he said um, the same people that fed the animals slaughtered them and so and there it nothing was weird about it and the animals were not afraid that's what he said. There was no sense when the animals came into the slaughterhouse that they wanted to get away. And that says a lot. Mm -hmm. So this is why food needs to always be on the program at CWA. <laughs> um, I've been th uh, through a kill plant for Coleman Natural Meats mm -hmm. um, in Texas in the Panhandle, and it is so profound, and I completely understand this reaction. Um, so we're going to segue right now to uh, student questions and they're flowing in so thank you um, and we have two that I'm going to bundle up into one because I think they're related and just dive in for answers um, I am a student how can we inspire more young people to get more invested in cooking and that's the verb um, and then I'm a student what um, what can college students actually do to be more sustainable but on a real college budget I'll take that. Um, I think that start cooking, and it's not a. Um, so I I don't. Well, I while well, I'm the board chair of an organization that's for chefs. I don't really identify as a chef. I I identify as a cook, and a baker, and um, cooking is cooking from scratch is a radical act. And start with simple cook from scratch. Cook real food. That that itself is an empowering, radical, social fun. And get good at it. Make it so it's not a big deal. Make it so it's easy. So it's organic. So it isn't a big stress. And then it becomes these other things. You know, it that in itself is beginning the activism. And the second question about on the lower budget, it's like you will find that. So I mean, this was some time ago when I was in college. But I somehow happened to self-select this my group of five women friends who I ended up living for two years in the same house. Called had a big G on the this is a little funny thing had a big G on the door. It was called the G spot. Um, <laughs> um, <laughs> that was for good food. right? Yeah, that was for good food. But for some weird reason, uh, we self-selected like everybody had grown up in a household that where food was cooked on a regular basis. And, and even the people who weren't in, who didn't, you know, there were different levels of that. But we, we would put $20 a week into the house. You, you had to shop one of your weekly things. We put $20 a week. We lived on, we ate for $80 a month. <laughs> and we would cook, we cooked everything from scratch at home. We would have, we would have dinner like five nights a week in college. And it was, it was a, and we, I'm still really good friends with a bunch of those women too. So I think that, um, I just say, start cooking cook what you can, cook what tastes good to you. Don't feel like you have to make it tall and spun and fancy and put away the squeeze bottles. Just <laughs> cook food. And I think it, you could say, look at cooking as a social time. Mm -hmm. Like ask your friends to come and cook with you and then sit down to a nice dinner. Or if you don't have friends who like to cook, but everybody likes to eat, you know, you spend the time cooking and then have your friends over. Make it, instead of going to the movies or instead of going to the club or go to the club afterwards. The, the bars, maybe? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, make, just look at cooking as your event for the night with hanging out and having a few 
fears and okay. <laughs> I will Fear say uh, yeah. I, I, I will say that look at uh, the the inexpensive food is all basically the peasant food from around the world and it all tends to really uh, skew vegetarian anyway and that sort of solves some of the the issues that are on the table up here in this session today um, but that that stuff is is easy to love because it's usually full flavored and um, now with access um, through the internet to lots of great recipes you can get started with some of those simple things um, and it'll also take you out of your comfort zone just a little bit into buying an ingredient or two that maybe isn't something that you would normally get the thing that I say is that like it seems like there's always the default we'll make a pasta dish Okay, and that's great because you can throw a bunch of stuff in there and it's fun and all of that. But I think we have to get away from that as being always the dis default for cheap food, fast food, that it can go to into something beyond that. Um, I mentioned uh, Indian vegetarian food um, in my talk yesterday, and I'll go back and sort of focus on that too. Um, a whole lot of the market cooking in Mexico is done uh, with all vegetables, and I, I love that kind of stuff too. So um, another question. Um, I am a high school, st I'm a senior in high school. I'm curious on your professional opinion. Um, the, regarding the current controversy over school cafeteria diets and students nutritional needs and what people can do to improve it there, there's there's a controversy yeah I guess that's mine it's Richard for <laughs> slow food and school gardens right One of the uh, yeah the, 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 at the core of what is so difficult and wrong about the way we manage um, school food is that we treat kids as um, items on an assembly line. Get them in, get them out, uh, what's efficient, uh, what's cheap, because if we were serious about um, feeding our future, um, we wouldn't spend as little as we do on, on school lunch. Um, but within the framework that we have, um, I think there is the issue of sourcing and transparency. So how can we get better food into the menu? Is that legislated and, and so forth? Um, and the mechanics to do that are very difficult. Um, there's the question of uh, demand. You know, if we put wonderful fresh food, will kids eat it? Well, we've got to grow this, a next generation of, of good eaters. And it, of course we can use sticks, but it's much better to use carrots. And I think this is where school gardens in particular come in. The garden is a gateway to transform the culture of the school and creating allies uh, in the administration, the cafeteria um, workers who are, of course, the most important ally and getting them on board. Um, uh, the kids, and then of course the kids come home with, with uh, stories to their parents. Uh, there's been some very innovative things done, uh, the edible schoolyard um, with, with uh, cooking nights where we invite, in, in the edible schoolyard in New Orleans when we established it, uh, nights where uh, the whole family is invited for dinner to eat and have a meal together to learn how to make a, a dish that's doable and to go home with those ingredients. Um, Animating the garden as a gateway to the cafeteria, the gateway to um, academic subjects out in the garden, getting kids to become protagonists for their own lives, their own food choices, um, that intimacy, uh, proximity to growing products and harvesting them, uh, they become advocates. And, and I think we see that as occurring. Uh, so investing in school gardens, food core, uh, all of the extraordinary school garden programs, uh, are not just about the gardens. They're about transforming the, the way in which we relate to food in the, in the schools. So if the garden food is gorgeous and there's something odd happening in the cafeteria, not just the food but how it's delivered, um, and treating the kids with the dignity of being eaters and eating as a social act mm -hmm. uh, rather than an assembly line, I think is how we begin to advocate for that. Mm -hmm. So I just want to encourage everybody here um, when you're not sending amazing questions to the app, uh, you can raise your hand. Um, I see that some of you are doing that. Um, but every one of you can join Slow Food. 
it, it, the cost of membership is totally approachable. Um, same with Chef's Collaborative. You do not need to be a chef. You just really need to be an eater, and you can join these organizations. Um, Rick and Deanne have an amazing foundation to benefit um, farmers and basically food culture um, of, of all sizes in their region, uh, so Frontera Foundation. Um, so, uh, you know, the era of kind of this is just for a chef's club is thankfully 30, 35 years ago. Um, a lot of questions are coming in about accessibility, which is why I brought that up. Um, and I think this does speak to some of the preciousness that the good food movement is um, often um, criticized for. So how do local enthusiasts acknowledge the need for all forms of agriculture that will offer a diversity of food uh, choices but still feed the world? So this is the feed the world question, right? So food snobbery can kill enthusiasm for great things. I'll say, I, I want to address this food snobbery thing just as a, a start. <clears throat> I think it's really important um, to not just bash the good food movement as uh, elitist and all of that, um, all things that um, start yesterday in, um, I think it was Piper that called it food couture, um, that when you start something in a certain area, the opportunity for it to trickle down or have a wider impact um, is really there, and it does all the time, especially in things like couture. Um, the, that, the trickle down effect is really massive. And in, this, in food, it's the same thing. If we started the, the, mo the good food movement only as a super broad based, it's got to feed everyone, we would have collapsed instantly because we didn't have nearly the uh, supply that we needed. And we have, uh, our foundation is in business only to grow farms. That's the only thing that we're looking for. We want to give them the capital investment so that they can become more productive and more profitable and stay on the land. And we have seen so many farms in the Midwest that our foundation has um, invested in. And, and these, honestly, are small investments. Um, that Nobody can believe that $10,000 will change a farmer's life, but $10,000 will change a farmer's life. And so we do 10 to 12 thousand dollar investments in these farms they give their grant applications of a project they want to work on be it a hoop house a greenhouse a watering system a delivery vehicle something that will actually make them more profitable and more productive and um, we have seen them grow and I like I always say that I'm in in the business of growing mid-sized farms small boutique farms are great and I rely on them to grow specialty crops for us but we need people that can actually produce a lot of food so that we can can actually distribute that food to a, wa a wider and wider audience. But it wouldn't have happened if the high-end restaurants hadn't worked with these farms and bought from them and made them more successful so that they could buy more land and, and grow their businesses. So um, I think the elitist part of it is, um, is actually damaging to talk about um, because we have to support it so that it can grow bigger. Um, it, it, the, over the last number of years, this movement has grown much bigger in the amount of farmers markets. If the farmers mark, if there wasn't any supply, the farmers market numbers would not have increased so dramatically. And now, as we say in Chicago, if you are um, a chef in a a serious restaurant, if you're not buying from all of the local um, farms, nobody takes you seriously in Chicago. That is a huge change, and that's happened in three decades, and I think it's a really important thing to keep in mind. Um, I'll tackle the feeding the world with the industrial food system. Um, the problem with, so we have a myth about, um, about production, about, ex uh, there's, there's a myth that somehow if we don't use fossil fuels to extract, ni we extract nitrogen from fossil fuels to spray on the soil that we have extracted every natural nutrient from in order to get yields on wheat that leave us with enormous, ec I mean, in, like this, this, this completely imbalanced food system. And, and, and that there is, 
there, I mean, my under, I am not an expert on global hunger, but my understanding is that we have the ability to, it is a, it is a, it is a resource allocation issue, not a production issue. And we also have to think about, we started our farming, our modern farming systems, this industrial fossil fuel based, fossil fuel based food system started with World War II. Okay, so it hasn't been that long, yet we have done a tremendous amount of damage to our environment through that. The Mississippi and the Columbia River are brown, not because it naturally is brown and flooding all the time, because there's so much dirt that is exposed to the earth that when it rains, the soil all goes down the river. They have to, they have to dredge the mouth of the Columbia River on a regular basis. All that amazing topsoil from the Missoula floods, from the entire Great Basin, is in the Pacific. It's not doing any good, right? So we have these tech, we're, we're totally flying in the face of, of not our, we're, we're, we're acting against our own self-interest, against our children's self-interest, against our grandchildren's self-interest. And so I think that it's almost the flip. It's not, it's not what does this movement have to do to, to not, like, it's not like we have to, oh, we have to have our little precious self and then the real ag movement. It's like, no, there's this place in the middle. And anybody who heard me talk yesterday, I gave a little lecture about ag in the middle, Google it. But there is this powerful place where we, my, my issue is with corporate agriculture, that when I don't want to trust shareholder returns with, with my life, my food, and our world's health, because I don't think they have it in their interest. And that's where the communities that Richard is talking about, the collaboration between all these, share, these, these shareholders has to come together. And yes, it is about, it's about a different system. The, there's the, there, and, and everybody can plug into that system where their values, where their economics, where their culture finds it appropriate. But I can tell you that really large contine, confined animal feeding operations and the, the, our monocrop petroleum-based system are, are, at, are polluting, green, are providing a lot of greenhouse gases and are really a threat to our future. They're not providing global um, security for, the glo for hunger. Are you just a little pissed? <laughs> <laughs> so, so I'm going to take this right to what's beneath us, one floor down. This is a student question. So what are your impressions of the food court downstairs? Oh, <laughs> that's great. There's a was, Papa John's. Yeah. Is there a subway there? I, I, I was actually super shocked. Yeah. Uh, this is my first time on this campus. And um, sort of knowing the reputation for Boulder and knowing a number of people that live here that are in the food movement and so forth, um, it's the kind of place that would make me super sad if I had to eat in there. So I, I thought at least there was like, could there not just be one sort of locally owned option that's trying to do like real food, not processed stuff? Um, we're getting a lot of questions about access, and um, one of the things I like to remind people is you are five and a half hours by drive at a legal, legal rate um, to the poorest community in America, Pine Ridge Reservation in South Dakota. You can leave here today, and in five and a half hours, you're in a place that is its own nation. Um, it's about the size of the state of Delaware and it has the highest teen suicide rate in the United States. Half of its population is under 18. This is where Wounded Knee is, Rosebud, the, the community of Pine Ridge. It's the poorest community, and a lot of your questions from students right on are about access. So this is a general question, is how can this darn sustainable, good food, organic, local, locavore movement actually be accessible to those who most need it? Well, I think it increasingly is. I, I, think, I think the, the movement is uh, being reinvented in communities all over the country, and especially, I mean, the testament to decolonization and uh, uh, the utter um, abandonment of rural communities uh, is creating not only a crisis but a, a creative response of growing, cultivating wealth and generating wealth in rural communities. Um, 
rather than what we tend to do is plunder um, and, and extract all the wealth. Um, I, I think on the, the issue of food access and, and, and vulnerable consumers, um, there are some, some creative responses that have worked their way up to federal policy. And uh, I know that Deb Eschmeyer yesterday talked about fresh food financing and grocery stores and food deserts. And, you know, the problem with some of the, when programs get to that scale is it's one solution that has, is meant to address many complicated issues. And, and one of the ones that I think has been a success in the food movement is beginning to influence uh, preventative health, public health uh, thinking about behavior change. And how do we change consumer behavior when everything is stacked against us to make good choices? Whether it's our food knowledge, the time in our lives, or the money that we have. And if we have l fewer resources to buy better food, well then any change is risky. So how do we mitigate that risk? How do we understand how it, it is easy to make better choices? Um, resources are the best way to do it. Minimize that risk by um, expanding food stamps, uh, SNAP, and making it um, more nimble, more flexible, so that you can now buy seeds if you're interested in growing. That is you know, allowed. You can buy small seedlings so you can grow your own food. But all of that comes around the idea, not so much of the stick of you know, you're poor, you're making bad decisions, uh, you have no access to fresh food, um, but what are the carrots that get people excited about food, uh, embracing the joy of it, reconnecting with food traditions that may have been obliterated. Um, I think it's, it's understanding that it's a journey and the behavior change is something that um, uh, has to move beyond the public health idea that we simply point out what bad decisions we make and begin to help make it easier to make better decisions. I would just jump in to say that it's all about uh, one step at a time, and I know that you get this sort of idea, this vision that we need to, like, in the next two years, solve all these problems, but it's going to be a lot of different people solving them in different ways, and I will say that this whole idea of legislating it into, a, into reality is probably not going to happen, so it's going to be we can support it with some legislation, but it has to be supported really strongly by all these different grassroots organizations. You talk about the SNAP program um, being uh, a little broader so that it can be used in farmer's market. The Wholesome Wave people have done amazing work with that. Um, visionaries that have started not-for-profits that are really making a difference in uh, getting greater accessibility for all of the, the people that are in greatest need of getting good food. So I think it's going to be, it's not going to just be legislating it into existence. I think it's going to be, it's going to come a lot from the grassroots. And if it, a lot of times the legislation leaves out what Richard said, which is all about joy and pleasure. And if we want to get those kids in the schools to eat that food, we have to bring joy and pleasure into it. It's really, really important to get them enthusiastic about it. That's where the, the school gardens come into play. That's where cooking classes in the schools, embracing the whole idea of sharing food with other people. That's all the beauty, the joy, the pleasure that is in food. And that is the thing that will bear people in, along and get them excited about doing it, not just being told that they have to do it. Um, I just want to say that our own Boulder County Farmers Market is kind of leading the pack on a national level in that it's partnered with the city of Boulder and um, anybody who gets SNAP bucks, SNAP dollars, gets two for one. So if you are given a SNAP dollar, the city matches it, um, Health and Human Services Department. And I can tell you a couple of the markets I worked here in Boulder last year, um, I like to count the money at the end, um, I just do. And more than 15% of our revenues on that day were from, from SNAP. And I thought that was a victory. So um, 
Another student question, and this has not come up yet in the food program. I was wondering when it was here at CWA, because I was kind of bragging that this place can be radical. So here we go. I'm a student. What are your true opinions on GMOs, and do they have a place in our future sustainable food system? Oh, Piper, take it. <laughs> I'm just going to. I'm just going to tee it up. Um, Okay, one thing about GMOs is that people like to say, I don't believe in them, and they exist. It exists. It's a technology. So this is, this is me and trying to figure out the nuances of it. And I think it's a technology, and like any technology, it can be used for good or bad. I think we don't know a lot about that technology, though, and there has been a real deficit of studies in terms of what the effect of this technology is. So there's that problem, and then there's the problem of that it's a... It's a, natu it's a technology, because it's a technology, it's been able to be, um, uh, the word is patented, and owned by corporate America. So that is the real, to me, the, some of the bigger problems is how it's being used. I think there probably are some health and environmental problems, some big ones. I mean, just for example, like the, the big way that GMOs are in our system is Roundup Ready crops. So anything that is a, that's a broad leaf, um, plant is killed by, is, is um, generally killed by Roundup. It's why Roundup will kill your weeds, but not your grass. So soybeans, um, corn, uh, alfalfa, sh alfalfa no. sugar beets, all those are, are broadleaf plants. And in order to keep the weeds out of your field and spray Roundup everywhere, you have to, you, you don't want it to kill your crop, but kill the weeds. So that's what they've done, is they've bred in an ability to survive the, the, the herbivore. I mean, the herbicide. <laughs> yeah. uh, you, you, you are, in fact, an herbivore. Yeah, I know. That's but like, it's not, not an herbicide, I hope. Yeah. So I think it's really complicated. I don't think they're, they're going to go away. I think we are going to have to legislate, study, bring transparency, and um, demand more information about. And Sylvia, but I know Sylvia knows more and has some really passionate yeah. feelings about this. I, I, I agree with Piper. <laughs> Anything Piper said? Well, I, I'm going to build on that. There's some pioneers of the organic industry that have um, chosen Boulder to be their home. Several of them are sitting here in the audience today. So founders of companies like Horizon Organic um, and the parent company, White Wave Foods. So I want you to know that um, the founders of Alfalfa's Markets, um, I was lucky enough to work with those pioneers when I was at Alfalfa's Markets, and that was pre-GMOs being, period. And so um, to, to get organic as regulations, and this is what I always say, it took 13 years from the Organic Food Productions Act of 1990 to 2002 for that label to become federally regulated. A lot of us naively thought it was going to be a two to three year project. It took 13 years for um, a bunch of activists to plead the federal government to please, please, please regulate this label and oh, can you inspect? all along the food production line. So that took 13 years. The first GMO product was a tomato flavor saver, and it took six months to go from UC Davis to testing um, at the retail shelf. There's something to be learned there in terms of taking more time to be hypervigilant and um, have research. So mm, I'm the moderator. I'm going to go back to a student question, OK? <laughs> Um, would like to, um, this has been asked, and I think Actually, this I is. Say one more, one yeah, quick thing course, on GMOs. Build on that. <laughs> um, one is we don't know. We don't know the technological impact. Um, but the rush to use it should be uh, an alarm call. Um, the one thing we do know is that it is certainly used as a distraction, as if it is the issue. And I think it is just a tool for in accelerating the monocrop system. And we care about biodiversity. Uh, it's crazy to put all of our eggs in one basket. And we've lost 90% of our biodiversity in North America in the last 100 years, and we should be concerned about that and know that GMOs will only accelerate that process. And that it is a, it's a technological discussion, a scientific discussion. If we don't know, that's not actually on the bounds that we're going to probably win. What is very clear is the politics of it. It is concentrating wealth in fewer hands, decision-making in fewer hands. And um, we want to empower farmers 
uh, and communities to control their foods, not large corporations. Okay, and I just want to say, somebody just asked, um, where may I get SNAP dollars? And I believe you go to City of Boulder Health and Human Services, and I think there's a pretty good link online, as well as you can go to the offices right downtown. Um, Iris and Broadway, okay. So um, we have, I think, one bona fide chef and one bona fide baker on the panel here, right? The rest of us are enthusiastic cooks and eaters, but um, <laughs> this student would like to have us please, 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 um, what is your go-to meal in a pinch for less than $10 that you can actually make in less than 15 minutes? If we can. Oh. <laughs> oh, I've got it. Oh, okay, so Sylvia showed me the question a second ago, so yeah. I've had a chance to think, and I got it. <laughs> okay, it's a piece of whole wheat toast with a lovely slathering of mayonnaise, topped with a piece of, of um, bib lettuce and, and a fried egg and a squirt of either tamasula or sriracha. <gasps> yeah. And salt and pepper. Are, are the chefs and, and baker, or the chef and baker, are we answering this as yes. well? Uh -huh. Okay. <clears throat> Do you need more time? No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> I hope I hope not. Um, I, I have a whole slew of them um, because uh, I do I do a podcast called The Feed, and um, we do cooking on the radio, I call it, uh, which is my favorite thing, because you have to describe in words exactly what's going on in the pan or the bowl or whatever. And so um, we, every third podcast that we do, uh, we have a, we call it a chef's challenge, where um, I and another chef from, usually from Chicago, um, make something with five ingredients in 15 minutes, and it's gotta be like, it's gotta be dinner. Uh, so we do a lot of those kind of things. But I, t I tend to move toward, um, like uh, tacos is a really fast meal that won't surprise most of you, I think. But anyway, um, so I, I guess that the thing that I would go to the absolute fastest is chorizo potato tacos with a fresh tomatillo salsa that has avocado blended into it. So there's some luxurious little touches in that. But the thing is, because it's a it's a starch based thing meaning it's the instead of being pasta it's it's done with corn tortillas um that gives you the opportunity to stretch some of the luxury ingredients without depriving yourself of them um, i'm super hungry right now <laughs> <laughs> um well this question one of the things um for who the, the people who are interested in that, how to start do, cooking at home whatever the first thing is is your larder so um, the the first step is to have is to have a few things that you know are ready to go that you've you've cooked so I'm a huge believer in you guys in Colorado you grow a ton of delicious pinto beans this is a pinto bean state buy dry fresh pinto beans at the farmers market they they might cost five dollars a pound don't freak out you only need like a third of a pound for and it's not even a quarter like dry to like it's it, it's it's still worth it. it may seem crazy so you're gonna some other day you're gonna have cooked pinto beans in your freezer they're okay they're fully they, cooked they don't cook in 15 minutes no okay? they're not I'm gonna just, cook I'm in 15 like minutes. letting everybody that's know why that. you've you but you've <laughs> built the larder you did that someday so you put you you walk in the house you pull the frozen beans out of the out of the freezer and you either put them in a bowl of hot water a stove a pot that you turn on the stove with water or in your microwave and then in the meantime Eggs, I have to say that eggs for, for eggs are some of the most af um, affordable quality protein, even at, like I think now, I can't believe it, at the farmer's market, all of a sudden eggs are, have become a $7 a dozen situation. Um, you know, at 50 cents an egg, I still think it's, it's really a high quality protein. So I would, I would do some combination of a bean, an egg, and because I'm a baker, I would pull a piece. I would, like, like Rick's got the tortilla to turn it into, I would do beans and toast Beans on toast with an egg. And we, we just have a few more minutes, so can we have a, a fast answer to the 15 minute fast food that's yummy? Me? Yeah. Yeah, I think one word, vegetti. What? <laughs> that sounded slightly dirty. <laughs> can you spell that? <laughs> Should you spell it? Oh, I can. <laughs> Richard? This, yeah. <laughs> Well, it's some, something that's okay. very quick. Is um, it's like a giant pencil sharpener for um, zucchinis. <gasps> uh, 
Thank heavens, I was going that way. Yeah. I was getting excited. Uh, <laughs> and we make, um, it's fun, it, it's fun in the kitchen. Um, we make zoodles, you know, yeah. and, and then marinate them in, in lemon juice and olive oil and um, feta cheese. And less than $10? Yeah, okay. and, and less than 10 minutes. Yeah. Vegetti, vegetti, vegetti. Yeah. <laughs> well, is that the name of that device? It is the name and of the device. And where can you get that device? Amazon.com, okay. right? <laughs> <laughs> there are brick and mortar places. Yeah. Okay, so everywhere. So we have we have five or six more minutes, and um, we want to end it with. Thank you all for your questions, by the way. Yeah, they were great, and uh, they were almost all student questions. So cool. you are the next generation. I really want everybody to be able to speak about the importance of deliciousness and pleasure. Um, but before that, it's important to talk about an event that's coming to Denver. So Richard, can you um, discuss the volunteer opportunity for everybody in the room this July? There are vast and, and <laughs> fascinating uh, volunteer opportunities. Uh, we, we, are, we know that it will take a region to raise a, a food festival, and I think an important food festival. In July of this year, and every July thereafter, uh, the 14th through the 16th of July in Denver, we will be staging uh, Slow Food Nations. Uh, the gathering and the opportunity to uh, explore food traditions and the people behind them, who they represent. So food as people, food, food as community, um, with tactile opportunities for eatings, meetings, tastings, tours in downtown Denver. So a free festival with a la carte workshops, uh, tours, and so forth. Um, people will be coming from all over the world um, to Denver to see what magic is occurring in Colorado and to, to learn and share and grow together. Folks from as far away as Melanesia, Japan, China, Cuba, Mexico, all of which um, to make food as a bridge. Um, we're really interested in building bridges, not walls, so bring a bridge to downtown Denver. Um, you, can inf you can email us at um, SFN, which is Slow Food Nations, info, SFN info at slowfoodusa.org, or connect with the Slow Food Denver team, who I think some of them are here, including uh, uh, Lauren and Andy. Um, so see them, back there. See them. And we would love your help. We would love to um, share the extraordinary things that are happening here with the rest of the world. And they just announced that Slow Food Nations is not a one-time gig, just like Terra Madre, which is a, an amazing tradition in Italy. Um, it will be in Denver year after year. So yeah. that's good. That says something about Rocky Mountain food culture. So if you, we could end for each of you to um, give, if you wouldn't mind, what is your wish for the next generation, for the high school and college students in the room? What is your wish for them in terms of their relationship with food? Or what, what, what would you wish that they could do to build a better food system? Well, I wish that they could, and myself included, and my daughter I wish this for, just really understand how much fun and enjoyableness food can be cooking together and eating together and spend the time doing it. I, I, it's just the best. I can be in the worst mood, have had a crappy day in the restaurants, and sit down to dinner at night with Rick and a, maybe a simple glass of wine, maybe, a, maybe not three. expensive, <laughs> maybe three, a lovely craft <laughs> cocktail. <laughs> and after a half hour, the world looks better. Okay, um, I, my wish for the up and coming generation is that uh, you look around and uh, see what you can do. It's, um, I don't think that solving the problems that we are all facing in creating a better food world is um, something that is not within our own reach because if everybody starts having dinners, starts cooking things, starts volunteering at a farmer's market, or at least going to a farmer's market and buying some things. All of those make changes in the system and never underestimate how powerful those simple acts can be. 
And I think one of those simple and enjoyable acts of resistance is to venture into, with others, into immigrant restaurants, mm -hmm. spend money there, reward their preservation of their tradition as the cornerstone of their economy. Oh, hard one. I can't decide between pie or chicken. Um, <laughs> But my, <laughs> I guess my hope would be <laughs> that everyone has access to a well-raised chicken, the time and knowledge to cook it and enjoy the, the, the multiple uses. So I, I'm just sort of obsessed, and I need to write this out sometime, is how like, I buy ridiculously expensive chickens that are like 20, everybody's like, you buy a $25 chicken? We get four meals out of it. And, and I don't know where else you get four meals out of $25 worth of protein. So I feel like the, the, that understanding that nimbleness, how to, it's a very simple thing, but it's also really profound and um, I think very thrifty and will be good for all. Thank you. Can you please thank these amazing <laughs> speakers? So go forth, yeah, yeah. shop no, well, chicken, and cook. It's like the cost, isn't it? <laughs> you were a great I was moderator. I was from the topic, and that's why I just said the Soviet Union. We got to get Thank over you. this stuff. <laughs> and, uh, yeah. no, 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 nicely done. Take a hey. <laughs> <laughs> Have sign will travel. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Thank you.